Hello everybody, welcome back to Doing Another Strengths and Materials Problem. And today we're going to be covering a little bit of a tricky topic called principal stress and max shearing stress. And there's a bit of theory once again that we need to go over before we can actually hop into the problem. But let's read the problem, see what it's about, and then go back to the theory, talk through it quickly, and then solve the problem. So the problem goes, at a point on the outside surface of a thin walled pressure vessel, there are stresses on the horizontal and vertical planes as shown. Determine the principal stresses, the max in-plane shearing stress, and the maximum shearing stress. And that's asking us to show the principal stresses and the max shearing stress on a three-dimensional triangular stress element. So there are some words that we've seen before here. We've seen element, we've seen uh, max shearing stress, but things get a little bit tricky when we start distinguishing between max in-plane, between max shearing, and what principal stresses are, we have no idea right now. So let's look at the theory and see what we're talking about. So let's imagine we're looking at a uh, typical stress element as we've done before. So in this element, we know that we can take planes or sections of this element based on an angle theta from x to n and derive for the normal stress and the shear stress that will be built onto that inclined plane based on these formulas here and here. We've talked about that in the previous video. However, we can look a little bit deeper into this and say, what if we only care about designing for this element? If we only cared about the design, we only need to focus on the theta that creates the max stress on that face. So what do we do? Well, we can look at a graph and plot all of the different stress values that are generated on planes based on the angle theta. So our x-axis is theta and our y-axis is going to be the possible values for shear and normal stress. Our dark pink line is the normal stress. The light pink dashed line is the shear stress. And all of these different values are representing a different plane. So for example, at this point here, at 30 degrees from x to n, we have a normal stress and a shear stress that are generated on that plane. So why is this important? This is important because we have critical values, maximum and minimum, for both the shear stress and the normal stress. And we can actually use our previously found equations to solve for these values, which is pretty cool. How do we do that though? Well, the relationship we know from this graph is that at the peak or an apex of a function, we know that the slope is zero because it's flattening out and going from increasing to decreasing. So that point is gonna have a slope of zero. And we know that this is the function for normal stress. So if we take our original stress transformation equation, we derive it and then set it to zero, we can actually isolate and solve for an equation that looks something like this. So tan two theta p, which stands for theta principle, is equal to this value here. Now, what does this mean? This means that we have a function to solve for theta p, which is where the principal stress will be developed. What is a principal stress? A principal stress is the normal stress acting on a plane where the shear stress is zero. How do we know the shear stress is zero? Well, from the information given uh, in, the, in the following equations, and by this graph, you can visually see that at any point where you have a critical shear value or a critical normal value, you're going to have a shear stress equal to zero. So how do we actually determine these principal stresses that we're talking about from this equation? Well, what can be done is we can actually take this equation, sub it back into the original stress transformation equation, and simplify it down until you're left with this final equation, which we will be using to determine our principal stresses. Sigma P1 will be the principal stress with respect to the X direction, and P2 will be with respect to the Y direction. Another key takeaway and relationship that's going to be important uh, for solving problems is that Sigma X plus Sigma Y should equal to Sigma P1 plus Sigma P2, pretty much just implying that uh, no additional stress stresses are gonna be generated from the given original stresses. Uh, another important fact about uh, these critical stress values is that the max values will differ 
by 180 degrees. However, in this equation, since we have two theta p, that means we are going to have a 90 degree, degree difference between theta p values for your principal stress planes. All right. Now we can also derive a similar relationship or take the same principles that we use for normal, normal stress to derive for the max shear stress that can be generated for a given stress element. Now, what do we have to do? We have to take the derivative with respect to theta, except this time we're looking at theta shear stress instead of theta p, because the uh, shear stress is actually not on the principal plane. And we're gonna talk about why that is in a second. We brushed over it a little bit here. We have no shear stress on a principal plane at all. Shear stress will be generated on a separate plane. Now, where was I? <laughs> this locates the max shear stress once the derivation is completed. And if you notice, we actually have a negative reciprocal to the original equation that we solved for earlier for theta p. And pretty much what this is going to tell us is that the difference between theta p and theta shear will equal to a 45 degree difference. Why is that important? This is important because we are going to be looking at a triangular stress element of 45 degrees. Therefore, we know from that theta generated on the element, we are going to generate a maximum shear on that plane. Now we could take this equation for the theta shear, plug it back into the shear normal equation and derive for the max in plane shear stress. So for that triangular element that we're first looking at, we have the max in plane shear stress equal to normal stress P1 minus normal stress P2 over two. Luckily, this simplified relationship is created once we plug that into the equation. However, this equation doesn't really consider the maximum absolute shearing stress, which accounts for the direction and orientation of principal stresses on the element. So for example, if you had a compressive force and a tensile force, you would have a negative and a positive. So how would you deal with those values? You would try and flip the sign to the negative and add it to the positive so that you can have a higher absolute value. So these conditions are going to account for that maximum possible absolute value. Uh, and we'll explain a little bit about what's happening in these equations uh, later on in the problem. But if you don't understand anything that I just said, don't worry, we're gonna hop into the problem and all of these equations are gonna make, make sense in a minute. All right, so let's hop into the problem. Let's see what type of forces we're dealing with on the stress element. We have a sigma y which is positive since it's acting upwards, it's gonna be 12 KSI. We have a sigma X, which is also positive 25 KSI. And we know these values are positive because of the arbitrary X and the arbitrary Y that we have as a coordinate system. And then we also have the 10 KSI. This is going to be negative because it, if we had a positive X here, this would be facing the opposite direction. So we're left with a negative 10 KSI. Now let's look first at the theta that we need to develop, which will generate the principal normal stress. How are we gonna do this? We need to look at this equation here. We have tan two theta P, which is equal to this equation. So if we brought the tan over making it tan inverse and bringing the two over using one half and multiplying that into the equation, we can actually solve for the principal theta, which is going to equal to one half the tan inverse of two shear xy, shear stress xy is negative 10, and then over normal x, which is 25 minus normal y, which is 12. Solving this equation, we are left with a value negative 28 point four eight degrees. So what does that mean? Well, we remember that uh, the theta 
measured from x to n is generally counterclockwise for positive. So this is a negative case. So this means that from x, we're actually going to be going below the axis. So if we consider this as theta p1, we can say that we have an angle here, which is 28.48 degrees. All right, so now we can actually see the element that we're going to be analyzing, which is this triangular stress element based on the orientation created by theta p, which we solved for earlier. So what's important here? Well, now on this element, we can clearly see the principal stresses here and here, p1 and p2. And we can also see that there is no shear stress being generated on these faces. However, we remember that the difference between theta p and theta shear is 45 degrees. And why was that difference important? That difference was important because we could take 45 from this original theta p orientation to get the cut on the plane for the max in plane shear, which is also very important. So now we have the critical values for shear and normal stress. So we can actually proceed with the problem and solve it as we normally would. So let me just move this over quickly. It's bugging my OCD. And now we can get into solving. So we're looking at the uh, principal stresses for P1 and P2. And we're going to be left with an equation that looks something like this. So we're plugging in our original values from before, 12 plus 25, using this equation right here. And then plus minus the root of 25 minus 12 over 2 squared plus the shear stress, which is negative 10 squared. And solving this, we are left with sigma P1, which is equal to 18.5 plus 11.9. And then we have sigma P2, which is equal to 18.5 minus the same. And this will equal to 30.4 MPA for principal stress one and 6.6 .6 for principal stress two. Now remember this relationship here, it's gonna check out when we add these together, we are left with 37 and 12 plus 25 will equal to 37. So our condition is satisfied. Now we can also take a look at the max shearing stress in plane. So max in plane is represented by P. And this is going to be the max minus the min. So in our case, it is 30.4 minus 6.6 .6 over two, which will leave us with 11.9 MPA. Now to finish off the way this stress element will look, we also need to consider some other variables such as the normal stress. So the normal stress at that plane uh, is going to equal to this original equation that we used in our previous video. Uh, and that's simply plugging in the values from before. So we have 30.4 plus 6.6 .6 over two plus 30.4 minus 6.6 .6 over two cos. And then what's the theta we're gonna use? We remember the rules from our previous video. We're gonna take two times that theta, which is 45 degrees, plus the shear stress that is created, which is zero. Why is it zero? There's no shear stress on these faces. So we have a zero variable here, which leaves us with a normal stress for the element equal to 18.5 MPA. All right, so I cleaned up the problem and these are our final answers for part A for principal stress and the max in plane shearing stress. And they will be placed on this element here. However, for maximum shearing stress, we actually need to look at the 3D element to understand why these conditions are making sense. So what does this mean? We have to calculate the maximum shearing stress and the shearing stress is based on these three different conditions. And these conditions come from an assumption that the orientation of this original element 
considers sigma p3 equals to zero, which would be the stress that would be coming out of the page on this face of the element that we don't consider. So what these conditions do is based on the orientation of your stresses, either compressive or tensile, it will say, oh, I can orient the shape so that uh, sigma p2 is instead zero and is replaced by sigma p3, their values swap. And then similarly for this conditions, we can say, oh, based on this orientation, I can have sigma p1 equal to zero and have that value swap with sigma p3. So I hope that helped clear up kind of uh, where these numbers are coming from. Another way to think of it is you always have to have a principal stress equal to zero if you have principal stresses acting on a different plane in a specific orientation. It's just a rule uh, that applies for all uh, stress elements, which is why it's allowed to be used. Anyways, enough with the rambling. No more theory today. Uh, let's just look into plugging and chugging. So the shear max for this reoriented, reoriented element is going to be based on 30.4. And if we subtract 6.6, .6, it's obviously going to get smaller. So we want it to be subtracting zero. So we're going to take 30.4. We're going to divide it by two, uh, which is going to leave us with 15.2 MPA. So what does this mean in this condition? This means sigma p2 is equal to zero, sigma p3 is going to equal to 6.6. .6, which also means we need to solve for a different normal stress in this condition. And we only have uh, one stress to consider, which is the 30.4 over two plus 30.4 over two cos, remember dealing with the triangular elements still, we have two times 45, shear normal is going to be equal to 15.2 MPA as well. So this would be your final answer for the 3D element, and this would be your final answer for the in-plane element.